and good morning good morning good morning how's everybody doing today who do I have in my live stream broadcast I see that we've got at least three people here Johanna are you here Dimitro are you here Caleb of course of course got my regulars got my regulars fantastic it's always good to see people hello Johanna good to see you fantastic always good to see everybody here thanks a bunch I appreciate you coming today uh, I hope you're having a wonderful week so far um, remember we have the first exam coming up this weekend it'll be available on Friday morning around nine o'clock and it'll be uh, due Sunday evening by 1159 I'm trying to set it up so that everybody can be successful on this test. It's certainly not going to be, uh, uh, I'm not going to try to kill you on this test. Uh, good morning, Johanna. Fantastic. Cool. Uh, anything interesting to report? What's happening good to you today? Anything good happening? Anything bad happening? What's going on? Tell me a story today. I'm doing pretty well. Uh, I was supposed to go to the mountains this weekend, but that fell through. So we're stuck uh, doing. Uh, good morning, Matthew. Good to see you. Fantastic. We're just sitting here talking about our plans for the weekend. I don't know if you have anything happening this weekend that'll be interesting. I was supposed to go to the mountains, but that uh, fell through. Okay. So remember this week we're talking about chapter 6 and chapter eight we are skipping over chapter seven so we're going to finish up yeah things happen you know um so we're doing chapter six and chapter eight this week remember we are skipping chapter seven so today we're going to finish up with chapter six and then and then move on okay so we're in chapter six the cell uh let's see there we go um and Today we're going to talk about attributions and the different models uh, about the self, making attributions about the self. We're going to talk about impression management and some of the strategies that people use to manage their impressions. And we're going to talk a little bit about high self monitors and low self monitors. Okay, so let me go back up here in the corner here. Um, Let's consider this question. If being a doctor is such a great way to get rich, why doesn't everybody go to medical school? Can somebody answer that question? If being a doctor is such a great way to get rich, why doesn't everybody go to medical school? I see we have some crosstalk in the browser. I'm absolutely loving that. Uh, uh, Johanna and Dimitro talking to one another. Fantastic. I, I haven't seen much of that in my cl either class this semester, so I'm really excited to see y'all chatting with one another. Why wouldn't somebody just, why, why doesn't everybody go to medical school? Why do we not all go to medical school? Because some of us probably don't believe we could make it through medical school, right? Do any of you have friends that you think are underachieving based upon their ability. They're just not doing what you think they could. It's too long for, it is too long for school, right? Do any of you have a friend that you think is underachieving based on their ability? Are any of you underachieving based upon your ability? Hmm? Now, here's the deal. The early theories of human motivation said that all human beings were motivated by rewards or reinforcements and the avoidance of punishment. But you know what? Sometimes people will do things even though these behaviors don't lead them to be rewarded. And you know what? Some people even engage in life strategies that punish them, right? How many people do you know do things that only intensify their suffering and pain? And the question is, why do people do these kinds of things? So today we're going to talk a little bit about the self and we're going to talk about how 
this self sort of motivates or affects the way we think about ourselves and the way we behave, okay? And the people who are interested in these types of processes that we're going to be talking about today are what we call social cognitive psychologists. And they're interested in understanding how people's self-beliefs affect their behavior and life outcomes and their thoughts about themselves, okay? Now, uh, here's what I want you to understand about thinking. And this, these processes cut across a lot of things, but they also cut across uh, thinking about the self. But human beings engage, I would, like, I would like to characterize human thinking as either being controlled or automatic. And we have very little room for controlled, thoughtful processing. So a lot of the thoughts that affect us, that do things for us, that we have are what we would call automatic, unconscious processes. How many of you have ever done something that maybe is sexist or racist because you weren't really thinking about it? How many of you were uh, called somebody, said thank you, sir, when it was a female talking to you, or thank you, ma'am, when it was a female, a male talking to you because you were sort of on autopilot? Anybody ever been on autopilot before? Right? So, uh, what psychologists do know is that human beings have a little bit of attention to pay attention to things and to think carefully. And those are what we would call controlled processes. And this is when we actively and intentionally think about things. And within this week's context, I'm going to be uh, talking about how we intentionally think about ourselves. But unfortunately, human beings only have a small attention span. So a lot of the things, thoughts that go through our mind uh, do so automatically. And so sometimes we base our decision making or our thinking on self-beliefs that we don't really pay much attention to. So all of you probably have uh, um, things that you learn, fears and anxieties that you learned early in your life that really affect the way you act today. And so uh, the way we think about ourselves involves both controlled processes and unfortunately a lot of automatic processes that are unhelpful. So um, when, you, when you sit and talk and think about yourself, do positive things come to mind? Do negative things come to mind? When bad things happen to you, do you say, here it goes again, I deserve this? Or do you say, wow, that's new and something challenging that I can handle? A lot of the ways in which we think about ourselves happen automatically, happen automatically. All right, now, one of the things that human beings do uh, is they make they explain why things happen to themselves. And attribution is an explanation for why something happens. That's the, that's the definition of an attribution. An explanation uh, for why something happens. All right? A self-attribution is an explanation for why something happened to you. A self-attribution. Why did you pass that class? Why did you fail that class? Why did you get kicked out of school? Why did you get that promotion? All of the answers to these questions are what we would call self-attributions, explanations for why things happen to us. Now, why are attributions important? Attributions are the foundation of the motivational system. When animals move around the world, they have to understand why things are happening to them in order to make logical plans. Just like every other animal, human beings have to understand why things happen so that they can adjust their behavior. And self-attributions are where human beings do that by explaining to ourselves why things happen to us. Now, consider the following statements that a person might make when asked how they managed to pass a difficult exam. How many of you have ever had a really super hard exam that you had to take? Maybe it was some sort of nursing exam that everybody's supposed to fail, or it was an end of grade test, or you took this chemistry class and they told you, oh my God, the exams are so hard, right? If 
uh, here are three different statements about why somebody passed the exam. I passed that exam because I studied hard. The second person says, I passed that exam because I'm smart. The third person said, I passed that exam because I was lucky. Now, look at these three descriptions of why people pass the exam. Which one of these people do you think uh, uh, has the best sense of self? Who, who would you rather be? If you had to pick one of these three people, who do you think is going to pass the next exam? Hmm? Right? Do you see how these, def these explanations are a little bit different? I studied hard. I am smart. Or I was lucky. Do you see how those are different explanations? The first person is saying it was all about their effort, something they could control inside them, something that they could put out. The other person said, you know what? It's something about me, but it's not really something I can control. It's just a quality of me. And then the third person is saying, hey, uh, that outcome has nothing to do with me. It's not controllable by me. It's not a part of me. So each of these people has a different explanation about why they've had success. And you, every time, every uh, multiple times a day, you walk through your day making explanations for why things happen to you. I was able to uh, complete that project because I worked really hard on it or because I'm just good at these kinds of projects or because that project was easy or that project was hard. These are all explanations and every day you're going through your day giving explanations or self attributions about why you were able to do things. Now, these self attributions are automatic processes that you don't really think about a lot but they do provide the motivation that runs your engine. If you have a motivational style which takes the power away from you and attributes it to luck or easy or people like me, then that's going to take your own motivation away because why should I try if it has nothing to do with me? On the other hand, if you're the kind of person that says these outcomes occur because I really, really worked hard and tried hard, that gives the power back to you. And so in new or novel events, you might make the guess that you can work hard to achieve in those areas. All right. Each of these reasons is an example of an attribution about this person's success on an exam. Notice how each of them are a little bit different. Now, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about several different attributional theories. We're going to talk about Rotter's locus of control, Viner's attributional model, explanatory style, and self-efficacy. These are all ways of managing uh, uh, attributions about the self that are effective in helping us to either be uh, more successful or less successful. So yesterday I was just talking about the self and self-esteem. And self-esteem is just a general belief you have in the goodness or badness of who you are. But attributions are more fundamental for motivating you to do things or not to do things, right? And right here below me is this crazy attributional uh, model. This is not uh, this is not something you're going to have to have on, know on your exam. But what I want you to see is it's sort of, if you will, a flow chart which a human being goes through when they're trying to interpret why something happens to them. Okay, so in a sense. We are all scientists trying to figure out why we are successful or why we fail, okay? So with an event or an outcome, it either turns out well for us, it turns out positive or negative for us. 
we then try to explain. We become a scientist and try to figure out why it turned out well or it turned out poorly, right? And so we go down through these perceived causes and we can either decide that it's internal to us or external to us, our locus. We can decide whether or not it's something that's going to stay the same or change, whether it's stable. And then we're going to talk about whether or not uh, we can control it or the controllability. And so these sort of judgments about our abilities will then cause us to come up with uh, feelings about the events that happen to us. Okay? So, let's talk a little bit about locus of control. Uh, this is probably the first attempt at trying to understand human beings' own internal attributional style. And this guy, Julian Rotter, uh, suggested that human beings just have this, he, he sort of started it all. He said, let's think about human beings as having a belief that they can either affect their own outcomes or they can't affect their own outcomes. And so he argued of it, thinking of it, think about it as sort of a personality style. Are you an internal or are you an external uh, personality? So do any of you have a friend? There you go. Noda wants to be, Demetra wanted to be the person who studied hard. Absolutely you do, uh, Noda, because you can always study hard again. If you got lucky, then why, then, then you might get unlucky next time. Great point, Demetra. Now, here's the deal. Somebody tell me, do you know anybody who thinks that the world is about uh, luck? Do you think, how many of you think that, uh, that, uh, that the world is driven by fate, that things are just going to happen whether you try or not? Do any of you have that kind of belief? Do you believe in fate? Do you believe in luck? Do you believe in karma? Okay. Now, I'm not saying you are or you are not, but karma, luck, and fate are the kinds of beliefs that people we call externals would have. So people who think that it's all about luck or timing or things outside of themselves have what we would call an external locus of control. On the other hand, some people think that they are the ones that control the events that happen to them. They say things like, I worked hard. I'm smart. I really, really wanted it. I was the best person for it. These people were what we would call internal, uh, uh, internals. And so one way of thinking about it is that some people just tend to have an internal locus of control and some people tend to have an external locus of control. Now, uh, I'm not going to tell you <clears throat> how your life is or what you should uh, believe, but I would suggest to you that people with an internal locus con of control are going to be more proactive and more active in dealing with the stresses of life. And you ought to try to uh, become uh, more uh, internally focused when it comes to your locus of control. And so looking underneath, this is a chart, I think, from your... Uh, from your book, internal attributes, my personality, my age, my gender, my skills, my ethnicity, my education, my intelligence. These are all qualities of me that matter, okay? On the other hand, I might say if it was the setting, it was just a weird classroom, the other people there were just so smart. You know what? I didn't understand the rules and the rules were tilted against me. You know what? It was just a, it was a rainy day. I can't play well on a muddy field. Uh, it was the time of day. You know what? I'm not a morning person and we played in the morning. Um, so, uh, so there are different ways you can think about the things that affect your outcomes. And I will tell you that an internal locus of control is probably a more effective personality style to adopt. Now, we're going to take that and we're going to readjust, we're going to add to that just a little bit. Um, so, oh, hold on. That gum, my camera's all in the way. I didn't mean for it to get all in the way like that, but it is. There we go. All right. There we go. Okay. Lock them back up. There we go. So uh, this guy named Bernard, Bernard Weiner added a second dimension to this model. He said, you know what? Thinking about internal 
or external, uh, that's useful. But really, people also make the judgment about whether or not this quality is likely to change. So think about it. Uh, you tried hard and worked really hard. Like uh, uh, Demetrio said, he'd rather be the person who studied hard. Uh, uh, if you're the person who was smart, uh, Demetro in another situation might be able to outwork you. Demetro, why wouldn't you want to be the person who was smart rather than the person who uh, studied hard? What's the difference to you, uh, Demetro? If you would, go ahead and type that in the chat bar. And so uh, what Weiner suggested is we needed to add this second dimension, whether or not these causes could change or not. If you think about it, if you're a smart person, you just have that level of smart, and there you go. That's what you can do. And that's a very internal quality. However, if you meet something that's above your level, and you're saying that you are simply smart, you can't change your level of smartness. On the other hand, if you're a person who works hard, and you meet a task that is more difficult, you can change your level of effort. So uh, he suggested that we think about these attributional styles as including sort of a di stability dimension as well. All right. So here's the deal. When you do well or do poorly on an exam, is it an internal unstable cause? You know what? I didn't try very hard. Um, I didn't uh, I didn't I didn't feel very good. Uh, I was kind of tired. That's an internal but an unstable uh, attributional style. On the other hand, an internal stable would be, you know what, I'm just that good at this activity or I am just smart at this activity. Now, when you look at these two, I'm going to suggest to you that the stable internal attribution can sometimes be problematic because when a person is faced with something that is above their ability level, a person who thinks that uh, their performance is all about their talent may not be willing to work a little bit harder. On the other hand, the person who generally uses the internal unstable causes of effort, that person may see a way to change their performance to achieve a better outcome. Ah, a smart person would never say about yourself that he or she is smart. You know, I would agree with that, uh, Dimitro, and it's probably because they know that their smartness is a function of how hard they work too, okay? Um, you know, I saw an interview with Ed Sheeran, uh, the musician. I don't know if any of you he have heard of the pop star Ed Sheeran. He said he really laughs when people come up and tell him that he's just a great natural artist. And he made the joke about how hard he works and he actually showed an earlier performance uh, he has on his phone of him and he is not very good. And so what he's trying to suggest is uh, his ability, his performance, his stardom is not a quality of necessarily any fixed ability, but it's all the effort that he's put into the activity. Now, people who are externals, as I suggested to you, the people with the external, uh, the uh, ex external uh, causes are going to a lot of times uh, be more willing to give up. Uh, they're not going to focus and 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 uh, and uh, be able to uh, uh, meet with failure as adequately. And so, an external unstable would be saying, "Oh, I got lucky. It just happened. This chance, boy, I got an easy teacher. The test questions just happened to be lucky." Or some people say, you know what, the task was just too hard for me, which is external and stable. Okay, and so uh, in a sense, uh, you can think of these two basic dimensions uh, as sort of a way that people use to make attributions about why they are successful or fail in their life. Now, uh, here's the deal. How many of you, which, if you had to pick one of these four, one of these four areas, what do you typically do when you uh, are successful or failure? Is there one box that you tend to pick out? Do you tend to say, you know what, I'm just good. I'm just good. Um, or do you say, man, I really, really worked hard. 
or are you a person who believes in luck and karma or do you just when you fail do you say man those things are just too hard for me I would argue I hate to say this but uh, I tend to be more of a stable attribution kind of guy when I do well at things I tend to attribute it to my ability and my overall cleverness um, and when I can't do things I tend to say wow that thing is just too hard for me um, and I probably could spend more time uh, thinking about the amount of effort that I put into things to become good and uh, allowing that to help me understand my failures better. Sometimes I give up a little too quickly because I make the stable judgment that it's never going to change. Now, uh, down here at the bottom of this chart, you'll see it says controllable or uncontrollable. Some people have even suggested a third a third dimension, whether or not I can control uh, that unstable thing, or is it something that is uncontrollable, right? So luck and chance are not controllable. Effort and uh, fatigue are things that I can control uh, to a certain degree. And so this is a way of making attributions about the things that happen to you. And so what I'm going to suggest to you is to examine how you attribute the successes and failures in your life and find out which of these squares uh, you tend to uh, go to. And I will tell you that in internal unstable causes a lot of times are going to provide the most motivating uh, behavior for you because you're going to continue to increase or to focus on these unstable qualities that are inside you. How hard I work, whether or not I'm tired or rested, uh, whether or not I maintain a good attitude. These are the kinds of things that you can control. These other things are harder for you to control, so it's going to be easier to give up and quit. All right. Now, um, this fellow named Martin Seligman actually wanted to try to understand uh, uh, how people dealt with bad situations at work. So he went to a big organization that had just done a massive layoff. And he had people fill out questionnaires. Um, and then he tracked these people to see how successful they were in dealing with the negative emotions of getting laid off and how successful they were in resuming activities by finding another job, another good situation, another positive. And he, he uh, realized that these two people, uh, these two groups of the people who were successful differed from the people who were not successful after the layoff because of a quality he called explanatory style. Explanatory style. So he went to this business where they did these layoffs. He followed the people and he asked them lots of questions and tried to characterize the difference between those people who dealt well with the layoff and those people who dealt poorly with the layoff. And he found a quality he called explanatory style, which is the tendency to use similar causal attributions for a wide variety of events. Uh, and he suggested that some people had uh, a, an optimistic explanatory style and other people had a pessimistic explanatory style. All right. So the people who had the optimistic explanatory style, they attributed their sex uh, their setbacks to external, unstable, and specific factors. Well, you know what? It just happened. This is what the business did. Uh, this is their decision that they made. And I am still uh, a, a quality person. So they didn't lay me off because I'm inferior. They laid me off because they had a need. It was external. It was unstable. It's just this temporary thing. All right. And it's because of their merger. Right. So they uh, explained their setback using these self-protecting terms. On the other hand, the people with the pessimistic pessimistic explanatory style saw the layoff as occurring because they weren't good enough. There was something wrong with me 
And it wasn't just one ability I was doing. I'm just not a good employee. And so what he found was that there were two basic ways of dealing with this layoff. Some people used an optimistic explanatory, explanatory style and other people use a pessimistic uh, explanatory style. So when bad things do happen to you, when bad things happen to you, uh, do you make some sort of judgment about yourself? Do you say, wow, I'm not a smart person. Uh, what was wrong with me? Do you make that pessimistic uh, judgment or are you an optimistic kind of person? So here's the deal. I, I, as I suggested to you, I went and applied for my dream job uh, a while back and I really thought I was a strong candidate and I did a great interview and my resume was awesome. And when I didn't get the job, how am I going to explain that to myself? Well, what I did was I made it external and unstable. Hey, it was these people, they made a decision and it was based on their need for uh, this specific kind of person who was somebody else and not me. So what I tried to do was I took all of the negativity away from myself and allowed me to still maintain a positive sense of self. The idea with these, uh, with these attributional styles is that you want to choose an attributional style that protects the self. Bad things are going to happen. You have to be able to protect the uh, self by using your uh, attributional style. Okay, and so uh, we've got internal and external locus of control, right? Uh, we've got a model that includes locus of control as well as a stability dimension. And I suggest to you that how we combine these judgments, stable, unstable, internal, external, can either lead us to having an optimistic explanatory style or a pessimistic explanatory style. Now, if something good happens, you would want explain that positive experience based on internal and maybe unstable qualities. Well, I worked hard and it was about me. And so what, uh, what Seligman found was that the way in which you manage these internal and stable internal, external, and stable, unstable judgments uh, allowed you to protect the self in times of negative outcomes. And I would ask you, are you a positive, are you an optimistic or a pessimistic person? Now, um, and so one way of thinking about self processes is that human beings use attributions or ex explanations for why things happen they can either use them to buffer the self from negative events or not to buffer the self from negative events. And remember I said the self is just a series of concepts that you have in your mind. And human beings are motivated to maintain a positive sense of self if possible. And so attributional style can lead you to do that effectively or not do that effectively. Now, uh, self-regulation and self-efficacy, they're not necessarily interested in how people explain events to themselves, but they're interested in a quality of control that is associated with success. Okay, Dimitro's uh, optimistic most of the time, and you of all people are having some of the strongest challenges. I admire that in you, Dimitro. Fantastic. By the way, thank you very much, Dimitro, for... Uh, for, for commenting a lot today. I really, really appreciate your being engaged in the, uh, in the lecture. And so the people from the self-regulation and self-efficacy, they aren't so much in people's explanations of why things uh, come, but how people are able to control the self, to control the self. So one of the important qualities in determining how successful you are as a student, how successful you are as an employee, how successful you are as an adult, is your ability to control your impulses. How many of you have ever done something that you shouldn't have done because you couldn't control yourself? Maybe you made that rude statement to somebody then you should have kept your mouth shut. Maybe you made that romantic comment to the wrong person that you shouldn't have made that wrong com 
comment to maybe you uh maybe you ate that piece of food that you shouldn't have made how many of you have lost control momentarily happens to the best of us doesn't it well we're going to talk a little bit about that quality here uh in this slide uh, self-regulation and self-efficacy um actually uh self-regulation is a process of directing and controlling your behavior controlling your uh controlling your impulses and focusing on some self-directed goal that you have chosen. And your book suggests that self-regulation takes effort, right? Uh, if you if there's something you really, really want and you have to avoid doing it or trying it or taking it, it takes a lot out of your uh, out of you to control your impulses, especially if those impulses or are strong. And so one way of thinking about that is that our self-regulation is this ability we have, but it's not an infinite ability um, and it can be strained in times uh, where we are asked to control our impulse. Now, a really cool study that was done in the late 60s uh, by a gentleman who actually argued that personality is not a very important thing to think about. He argued instead that we should think about self-regulation as the only quality of human personality that really matters. And what they would do is they did this really cool experiment with kids called the marshmallow test. And they would take kids of all different ages, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, and they put them in a room and they'd put a marshmallow. You know what a marshmallow is? It's a treat. They'd put that treat in front of the kids and they would say, hey, listen, this is one marshmallow. I have to go out for 10 minutes. If you'll wait until I come back, if you can hold off eating that marshmallow till I come back, I'll give you a second marshmallow as a reward. So they gave these kids a marshmallow and they left the room. And they said, if you can hold off, resist the temptation to eat this marshmallow for 10 minutes, I'll give you two marshmallows. And what they found, of course, is that the younger kids were not nearly as good as the older kids at resisting the temptation. I've got video I can show you this week in class where kids are actually nibbling on the age, edges of the marshmallow, trying to eat just a little bit without getting caught. And some of them just lose it and just eat the whole uh, marshmallow. What they found is that younger kids were not as good as the older kids. However... Uh, what these researchers found was that of the same aged kids, those kids who uh, did not eat the marshmallow, uh, if you followed them later in life, those kids demonstrated the self-regulation skills and were better, had better academic and job outcomes as adults. Okay, so children who restrain themselves from eating the marshmallow have better educational and vocational outcomes later in life. And so uh, this gentleman said, hey, let's not worry about personality. Let's not work about attributional style. Let's instead think about self-regulation as the most important human quality that allows us to be successful as adults. Okay, self-regulation. Now, I'm going to change that and add one sort of change to it. Let's talk about self-efficacy. All right, now this was a concept dreamed up by a fellow named Albert Bandura. And he argued that locus of control, internals and externals, suggested that you just either had it or you didn't have it. He instead said, you know what, let's think of it as being uh, in very narrow ability areas. So instead of saying I'm either good or I'm not good, he said most people say I'm good at this, but not good at that. Good at this, but not good at that. So instead of thinking of an overall general quality, self-efficacy treats our feelings of competence as very specific uh activity related abilities so he argued that we should think about self-efficacy as one's belief about one's ability to perform behaviors that should lead to expected outcomes so i know how to paint a picture i know how to run a live broadcast i can do a live broadcast 
Chris, can you live stream? Absolutely. I feel very good at live streaming. How many of you are afraid of talking in public? I am not afraid of speaking in front of a group of people. I have uh, public speaking self-efficacy. Uh, self-efficacy is your specific belief about your ability to engage in a successful course of behavior in a specific area. It is very important to healthy adjustment. People who don't have a sense of self-efficacy will not be able to put themselves on a diet or change their eating habits or exercise more. Being, feeling good about your ability to engage in an activity uh, affects how hard you will try and how long you will fight in the face of uh, frustration to achieve an activity. How many of you feel like you're not a good student? I'll bet you I have a couple of people in here who say, oh, I'm not a very good student. I never did well in school. Do any of you have that belief? Actually, Dimitro, I'll bet coming from Eastern Europe, one of the things I know about Ukrainians is they are very good students. All the Ukrainians I've ever had are very good and hardworking students. I'll bet you, Dimitro, you probably feel like you are a very good student, right? And I'll bet some of you may feel like you're not very good students. One of the things I found is that a lot of students have low, what I would call educational self-efficacy. They don't feel like they're going to do well in school. They expect to fail my exams. They expect to fail my class. On the other hand, I have some students who expect to do well in my class. I remember I had a, a female Ukrainian student about 15, uh, 15 years ago. And after the first class, she came up to me and she put her finger in my face. She said, I'm going to do well in your class. I am going to make an A in your class. I am going to work so hard. There is no way I'm not going to have the best uh, grade in this class. And the way she pointed at me, Dimitro, I wasn't sure if it was a promise or a threat. But this girl told me on the first day of class that she was going to make an A in my class. And lo and behold, she was able to marshal the effort together to, uh, to achieve this goal. She had what's known as a healthy sense of self-efficacy. And this guy, uh, um, uh, Albert Bandura said that human beings have these feelings of efficacy in lots of different areas of their life. And so I may feel like an efficacious student, but I have poor romantic self-efficacy. I'll never find love. Um, I'm a great employee, but I'm bad at uh, taking care of my finances, right? And so what he argued was that human beings have feelings of self-efficacy about lots of different abilities that they may have. And he argued that these feelings of self-efficacy are developed uh, from four basic experiences that occur in our life. The first is uh, we learn how to do these skills and we are allowed to be successful in those skills. Now, this may seem obvious to you and stupid, but how many of you have ever seen a parent who does everything for their kid? Does anybody know a child that is being spoiled by its parent? Maybe it can't talk. Anytime you ask a question, the parent answers for the child. Anytime the child gets a puzzle, the parent helps them put it together. Anytime the child gets homework, the parent does the child's homework for them, okay? A parent who is doing that is not allowing the child to engage in mastery experiences. And that parent is leading the child to a low sense of self-efficacy, all right? If, on the other hand, your parent never helps the child and the child uh, gets behind in school and is always failing, uh, the child is also not having mastery experiences. So anything that you ever feel good about, you are at some point challenged and allowed to succeed. Take this, uh, uh, I think we have Johanna, you're in here. Uh, um, and I'm not sure if we have any uh, parents in here. Uh, 
Um, but one of the things that you need to do is to allow your children to develop their own abilities, to learn how to be good at things, to be challenged by things. You got to help them when they're struggling. But if you do everything for your kid, if you spoil your kid, they are not learning. They are not having mastery experiences. And actually spoiling a kid, doing everything for them, actually leads to feelings of low self-efficacy because they haven't had these mastery experiences. Also, it's very useful to watch other people be successful. If you've ever tried to teach your kid how to swim, uh, one of the things that you're going to find is your child is going to be very afraid of getting in the pool and trying to swim at first. So it's always great to take them to a swim class where they see a bunch of other kids the same age that are swimming. And your kid's afraid to jump in the pool, but the four other kids jump in the pool and nothing bad happens to them. Then your kid is going to be willing to jump into the pool themselves. So we need vicarious experiences. We need to watch other people being successful uh, but you let them do things on there you go Johanna you explain them how to do it but then you let them do it on their own fantastic and let them be successful and let them be fail a little bit and when they need help you can coach them up but try to let your kid do as many things as possible uh, my wife's tendency was to try to be that perfect mother and do everything for the kids. She believes that a great mother uh, makes her child's life as easy as possible. I argued with her that no, your mother's job is to actually make the life just as hard as the kid can handle it so that the kid can learn how to handle more things. I'm not saying in a mean way, but you need to let your kid try to feed themselves, try to get their own plate and bowl, try to pour their own glass of water. All of these mastery experiences lead your kid to feel good about themselves. And you also, like I said, with vicarious experiences, you need to let them see other people who are peers uh, trying and succeeding as well. That's a great way to build uh, self-efficacy. Uh, now, uh, persuasion and encouragement. You need to provide a positive statement to your kids and encourage them. But really, uh, here's the crazier, craziest thing. It's easier to do this poorly than it is to do it well. If you tear your kid down, all it takes is one teardown of your kid uh, to ruin their self-efficacy. So your kid's trying to learn a new skill, how to ride a bike. They're watching the other kids ride the bike. Your kid starts trying to do it. You need to encourage them. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. But the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to tell them you can't do this or laugh at them or make them feel bad. If you tear your kid one down one time, if you give them negative persuasion, you can ruin a sense of self-efficacy super duper quickly. Even if your kid's learning the thing, uh, you know, and if you're tearing them down, I don't know if you've ever seen a parent who spends time with a pretty talented kid focusing on all the mistakes that the kid makes and how embarrassed they are because of those mistakes that the kids make. If you've ever been out to uh, a sporting event, a youth sporting event, you'll notice that there are parents sitting in the uh, stands yelling negative things at their kids when they fail. You can tear down uh, through the opposite of encouragement. You can tear down self-efficacy and make your kid want to quit an activity quicker than anything else I know. So you need to persuade them and encourage them to do it. But more importantly, what you need to do is make sure you never tear them down because that persuasion works in a negative uh, way. Now, here's the deal. Um, one of the things that happens is when we're put into situations where we're clearly going to fail, uh, we uh, have a strong emotional reaction. We get terrified. And people learn to interpret their feelings of fear as logical information that they're going to fail. 
So when my heart starts to beat fast, I make the assumption, I can't do this, all right? And one of the things that used to happen to me when I taught was right before class, my heart would start beating fast, and that would make me think failure thoughts. Now, I don't get uptight, and so I interpret myself as being able to teach this lecture. Whenever you folks have to get up in front of a group of people, I'll bet you your heart starts beating fast, and you interpret that emotional arousal as, oh my God, I'm going to fail. This is going to be horrible. So one of the things that we have to do when we're teaching kids how to have a sense of self-efficacy is to help them interpret those emotions and overcome those emotions. So you take your kid out and you let them try whatever it is you want them to learn. Let your kid uh, uh, help you clean up the kitchen. Let your kid fold clothes. Let your kid carry things. Let your kid do things that can build mastery experiences. Put them around other people who are doing the things you want them to do so they can see it's possible. Persuade and encourage them that they can do these things. And if you put them in situations where they are successful, what's going to happen is when you put them in the real situation, they're not going to get as nervous and they're going to interpret that as I can do this. And all four of these kinds of experiences help build a sense of self-efficacy that is very useful, okay? Self-efficacy is what you want to develop in your child. One of the things that I see in my students a lot is I see kids who have been taken care of most of their life and their parents have taken care of all of their problems, gone to school when they've had arguments, uh, helped them with all of their tests, never let them fail, uh, made sure they were on uh, sporting events teams where they were accepted. They never had to sit the bench. And if you make it so that your child never has to struggle and then you throw them into an adult world with lots of challenges, the child is going to feel overwhelmed, overwhelmed. When my kids turned 16, I did buy them a car, but I told them no gas. You have to buy your own gas. So they had to get jobs. When my boys turned 18, I took them down to the Verizon store and I signed their phone bills over to them. And I said, you know what? If you pay your phone bill, you'll have a phone. If you don't pay your phone bill, you won't have a phone. When my kids turned 19, I took them down to the uh, insurance company and I signed over their car insurance. I said, you know what? If you don't pay your car insurance bill, uh, you can't drive your car. And so what I've tried to do is put challenge upon challenge upon challenge starting at 16. My wife fought me at each one of these, but what I wanted to do was to build a sense of efficacy. I gave my kids something to do. I encouraged them to do it. I let them watch me doing it, and I persuaded them, and lo and behold, each challenge, they've been able to, to meet that challenge. Uh, we're actually going to uh, health insurance next year. They're both going to start paying their own health insurance bills. And what I've tried to do is to build up each of these challenges one after the other so that the kid has the resources to handle it and I coach them. And then each time we give them another task. And hopefully they're now uh, uh, able to deal with the negative events that challenge so many uh, young adults these days. Okay. <clears throat> Um, you know what? We are out of time. I'm going to have you just read uh, this last slide on self-presentation uh, and suggest to you that there are some people who uh, are who spend a lot of time thinking about what image they are presenting to other people. These are called high self monitors and other people are what we call low self monitors. We don't really spend too much thinking about what kind of image we are putting out there to the world. And so I want you to read a little bit about public images and self-monitoring on your own. All right, today, that's the end of today's lecture. Uh, it's Tuesday. Remember, tomorrow night we're going to have the webinar, uh, and I'm going to show you the marshmallow test, um, <clears throat> and we're going to take some, some uh, self-inventories and learn a little bit about our our intellectual and emotional functioning with regard to ourselves. Okay, um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, thanks, Dimitro. Uh, I appreciate you participating today. Johanna, same with you. Uh, I always love it when you blow my chat bar up, so please feel free to talk to me and to talk to each other. I love the crosstalk as well.
So unlike a regular class where you're encouraged not to talk to your other students, I actually like to see the other student chatting in the chat bar. Hey, thanks for coming today. Y'all have a great day. You are a fantastic class, and I look forward to seeing each and every one of you in webinar tomorrow night at, uh, at, 8, at 8 p.m. Uh, meanwhile, have a great day, and I will see you soon. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.